It's awesome to come to church and it's awesome to worship. But there comes a time in our lives and in our spiritual life and there's a elephant in the room, if you would say. A time where things that we like to talk about and things that we desire to experience is wonderful. But in all of our homes and in every church and in every relationship, there are elephants in the room that sooner or later must be addressed. And today we're going to talk about a topic. A topic that I believe that if I could teach you this topic, it could change everything about your life everything about your life. We've all played the game Monopoly. How many of you have played the game Monopoly? How many guys like Monopoly? I like Monopoly for about 20 minutes, okay? And after that, it gets, it gets old. I don't like giving up houses and hotels, and it gets very expensive to do that. But when we think about the game of Monopoly, more than 275 million games have been sold worldwide and available in 111 different countries in 43 different languages. There's all kinds of Monopoly. Every college has their Monopoly game. The longest Monopoly game lasted 70 straight days. In 1978, even Neiman Marcus offered a chocolate version of the game priced at $600. A game. But the whole premise of that game is totally opposite of the premise that Jesus gives to us to live our life by. Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. And the other scripture says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So the elephant in the room today is money. And it's not necessarily money. It's the spirit of generosity would be, I think, the elephant in the room. The spirit of generosity. It is something that I can say you need to give. And I can tug on your heartstrings and we can show pictures of of babies that are are struggling in in Africa or or Zambia. I I can get you to adopt a little child. But as soon as that baby's picture is off the wall, and as soon as you walk out that door, as soon as you go to Applebee's, as soon as you go to Starbucks, the pull of that baby is gone. We can motivate you to obligate you to give to a topic. That's not being exactly the way Jesus wants us to be. See, I believe being generous is a spirit. It is something that we do. You heard somebody, well, he'll give you the shirt off his back. He means he's a generous individual. When, when we can give, when we can serve, when we can connect, we can say, I love my church in all aspects of the church. I love my church. Every Monday morning, Brenda Eagle, our financial advisor here at the church, we sit in this room and, and we talk about monies. We look at the plate offering, the online giving, the Dylan's rebate and the Amazon rebate collection. And every morning, every Monday, we try to pay the bills and try to figure everything out. And, and uh, Monday morning, I say, folks, you're killing me. You're, fi- you're just killing me. What is the spirit of generosity? You're not giving to me, and you're clearly not giving to the church. It is a spirit of generosity that you give to God. And I want to give you a history. Many of you were here in 2004 and 2005, but many of you are brand new to this church. And I'd like to share with you for the next few minutes of where we are and how we got here. See, in 2004, we were having church over where the children's department is. We would pack that place out, and we were hitting the level of the lid. We would hit 300 people We'd hit that lid and we would fall flat back down to 225. Then we'd grow back up and hit that level of the lid and we'd fall right back down. 
About 250 to 300 on a normal day was the level of that. Now, we could pack more people in. We could do more services. But we decided as a church family back in 2004, we need to do something. And I was the, the voice piece. I was excited about it. I said, let's, let's build. And, and, and then we started talking about we can't afford to build. And I said, you know what? I'm too, I'm too hyper to wait 10 years in order to raise the $2 million. Let's do pledges. So we took pledges, and we took $12,000 a month pledge to the bank. And we had these people say they're going to give this $12,000 a month pledge. So the bank said, wow, are they secure? I said, yeah, they're in my church. They love Glenville. They would never leave Glenville. Guess what happened when we built the building in 2005? People started getting upset because this church wasn't like that church. We only moved 20 feet. <laughs> but it wasn't the same church. A couple of staff guys have some issues. We take 100 kids to camp one year, five kids to camp the next year. 2008 hit. The economy hit the tank. People moving, moving away fast. It was devastating. It was devastating to me personally, and it was devastating to the church. And that was the first time where a prideful pastor, guys, look what we have done. We were over there, we packed that place out, and I'd bring my pastor buddies in here. And they said, wow, this is awesome. And I was so prideful until 2008 hit, and then I was absolutely miserable. I said in 2005, I want to build this building. But I said, and I said in front of the church, I want to build the building, but I do not want to pastor debt. I don't want to come up and preach on money every month, and I don't want to lock the door and say, we're going to pass this plate again. We're going to pass it till we get enough money. I didn't want to pastor dead. I wanted to pastor people. And then 2011 hit. Another hit to the church. Another hit to the economy. Another hit to the aircraft industry. It was devastating. It was devastating to the point of depression. It was devastating, and, and that pride that I had about what God was doing with me and with the church, it flat left. And when somebody would talk to me about the church, I never mentioned the building. Because I started resenting pastoring these four walls. Because since we took those ple uh, pledges in 2004 of $12,000, just take last year, we were short every week $2,300 a week just in our building payment. So what do we do? That's a fixed expense. So we have to take variable expenses. We have to take flexible expenses, which is ministry, and we, we cut ministry. We cut, we cut children's ministry and youth ministry, music ministry. We cut the very thing that causes people to come into the church to have these stinking four walls. Guess what? You are the church, not the walls. So what we have to do is we have to figure out a way. We have to figure it a way now because ministry, the people's lives, the, the pain that they're going through, the kids that are getting baptized, the camps that we're sending them to, that is the ministry. That is why we are here. That is why we sacrifice. That is why the church exists. The church does not exist so we can have a building the church exists so the people that come in these buildings can be ministered to, can know about Jesus Christ, and can change their lives, and hopes will be filled. That's what the church is all about. But on Monday morning when I read that, I said, what's up, folks? You're killing me. You're killing me. All it takes, all it takes is 100 people to give $20 more a week to get rid of that's the that's the payment that we need on the building 
And then we can use budget. Youth ministry, children's ministry, choir ministry, music ministry, nursery ministry that is impacting people's lives. I'm asking you, if you love your church, we need to be generous. We need to be generous because we cannot be satisfied with doors and walls, sound systems, and orchestra. We have to be serious about getting into lives. We have to be serious about ministering into lives. I'm going to ask you today not to give an offering, but to learn how to be generous. To learn how to be generous. How do we learn how to be generous? I believe generosity is something that is taught and is something that we gain. It is something that I can give my boy a dollar at Sunday morning. I said, here's a dollar. Put that in the offering plate. Am I teaching him to be generous? Absolutely not. I'm teaching him how to put one of my dollars into the offering plate. But here's how I want to teach our kids how to be generous. This glass jar is in my driver's seat door. Okay? Every time I get into my car, I empty it out my pocket. I hate having change. And I put the change into my door. Okay? So every morning, I, I, I look at this, and sometimes I steal money out of this to get a Coke. Sometimes I do. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> if, you know, have you ever looked at your wallet and you're empty and, oh, okay, either, I'm going to embarrass myself, but I open it up. Uh, I need to buy this, and so I take change in. I want to challenge us. Every one of us has change. Every one of our kids buy something. Instead of giving them a dollar, five dollars or ten dollars just to give to the church. Because that's important. I'm glad you do that. But training them is this. They go buy a Coke. And it costs a dollar nineteen. And you give them two dollars. The eighty cents that's come out of that, ask them to put that in a jar. Not asking you not to let them buy the Coke. Asking them to put the rest in a jar. And when they see that money, and you do the same thing, when we see money that we had in our hands going to something that's going to impact people's lives, they participate. What they end up is they start owning what the money is going to. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also, I believe the art of generosity is a learned behavior. It's a spirit of behavior, and it has to start with love. If you do not love something, you will not be generous towards something. It starts with love. The benefits of generosity are so important. You know, faith is mentioned 246 times in the Bible. Hope, 185 times in the Bible. Love, 733 times in the Bible. But giving and generosity is mentioned 2,285 times in the Bible. Giving is the expression of faith, hope, and love. One-sixth of the Gospels talking about money. My favorite preacher of all times, Billy Graham. If a person gets his attitude about money right, it will help straighten out almost every other area in life. Now, if you were honest, and I don't want you to lie, so you be honest. What's the elephant in your home? What is the elephant in your house? What is it that you're afraid to discuss because you're afraid how you spend? Is it money? Is it generosity? What is the elephant in the room? In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, Paul is saying, Since you excel in many ways, in your faith, in your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us. He's telling the church, you excel in so many things. You're, you're good at what you do. You're a great communicator. You, you serve. You do children's ministry well. You serve and you have great faith. But he says this, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. Of the gracious act of giving. I want you to excel. I want you to have something that you can't get on your own. Two weeks ago, we talked about love, and we talked about connecting. Last week, we talked about serving. And we're talking about our church. We're talking about the body of Christ. And I'm saying, if our church is going to be loved by the body, we must be generous towards 
it. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Heart will always follow your treasure. What you invest in, what you own, what you take ownership of, we will invest in. David, when he was building the tabernacle, in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 14, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as a generous as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. When we have the mindset of generosity that is not mine, it's yours. Uh, at Christmas time, uh, I, I was a baby of eight. We didn't have a lot of resources, but, and my dad would give me uh, like $5 per child. And he says, I want you to have a, a gift under the Christmas tree from you for every child. And he said, here's what I need you to do. He said, I want you to make sure you don't spend that $5 on yourself, right? Now, let me get an idea. A greedy person would have bought the gift for $2.50 and pocketed the other $2.50. A generous person would have figured out how close to the $5 I could get for every person and spend every penny on the person in my family. Are we greedy or are we generous? The thing is, it wasn't my money. It was my dad's money giving it to me so I could be generous towards others. That same mindset we have to have towards our resources. It is God's money giving it to me, and he said, I want you to do certain things with it. I want you to be generous towards people. I want you to protect yourself. I want you to invest into your future, but I want you to serve and give. It is not our resources. They are from God. So the first point is very simply, I just went past. The first point, generosity draws me nearer or closer to God. Draws us closer to God. The second, generosity breaks up the, the grip of selfishness in my life. Let's be honest. How many of you guys sometimes have a little selfish streak written in you? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, you got a lie. How many of you guys have a lying streak in you? Because <laughs> most of us, there's times where we are selfish. Sometimes it's all about me. And I'm going to either be a giver or I'm going to be a taker. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Here's the bottom line. What you hold on to, what you desire, becomes what captures you, what holds on to you. The more you have to live for, the less you have to live on. When you start thinking of others, when you start thinking of your family, when you start thinking of the needs of the individuals, when you start thinking outside of myself, I can sacrifice this because I know they need this, and I can, I can make sure I can do away with some things because I want to make sure somebody is taken care of. We know what we've done. At Christmas time when we, we have our kids and, and they want something. My boy, first Christmas, he wanted a, he wanted a he, he's not playing it now. I'm glad I spent all that money on that guitar. But he wanted, I was like, that's not even it. He wanted this nice guitar. And usually we spend, you know, a certain amount of money on, on the kids. But this is my baby. And, you know, they won't know how much I'm spending on it. And I spoiled the little kid rotten. But, um, so he wanted this guitar. So I, I, I went to Guitar City and um, Guitar Center, and I was talking to some guys. I said, okay, I want, I want this guitar. And then they showed me how much it cost. I said, ooh, ooh, ooh. I said, Brett's going to be really mad because he ain't getting this much. <laughs> so I, I hid the guitar, and I, I got it. Down. And then it opened up on Christmas morning. Bryson opened the guitar up. He said, ah, oh, awesome. Thank you. That's wonderful. And, and, and he started playing it. And I said, see Brett over here. Open up his presence. He's, something's not matching up here. <laughs> something's not right. But you know what I did for Bryson? Is I sacrificed. I said, I need 
to hide this money. I need to put back this money. I need to do something because I know that's what he wanted. So I wanted to give to him a gift that would be wow. You know what? When he opened that gift, do you know what I wasn't thinking about? I wasn't thinking about my back pocket. You know what I was thinking about? The wow factor when he opened up that present. Because I sometimes and you sometimes will sacrifice when we know what we're sacrificing for is important. And folks, if I love my church, I think I can sacrifice for my church. Change a habit. Putting change in a jar. Teaching our kids to have a gifting, loving spirit. Training people to say, you know what? This money I have in my pocket, there's not a name on it. It's not going anywhere. I'm going to go to God. And when you see the change in your pocket, and you see that what God has given to you is already his, let me figure out a way to give it back so our kids, our families will see, you know what? It's already from God anyway. And then give the stinking little coins in your pocket back to God and see what God can do with you. See how much you can have. At the end of the sermon today, I'm going to ask you to do something. Our invitation is going to be very simple. Is I know you're not going to come down and pray that God's going to forgive you of all your, your bad habits and I'm not benevolent or I'm not, uh, I'm not going to give a lot of money. But what I'm asking you to do, I'm going to ask you to put your hands in your pockets. And if you have any change, come down and teach and train our families that giving is an act of worship. Giving is an act of worship. You know, that's why they used to have the offering in the middle of the worship service. Because now, worship is songs. But you know what worship truly is? Worship is not only singing songs. It's worship towards God. It's giving your offering towards God because God is the audience and he's watching what you're giving and he knows your benevolent spirit. He knows if you're generous or not. He wants to just see what you have. He wants you to give. Generosity strengthens my faith. Can I really trust God in the area of my money? Can I really trust God in my money? But let me... If I would ask the simple question, how many of you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and because you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you've accepted him as your, and you're going to heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done? Say amen. 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 I believe that. But I'm not going to let him have this. I trust God for my salvation, but I don't trust God for my financial situation. I can pray when I need it, but when I have it, it's mine. I need God to take care of me in every area of life. Listen to this. Found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is, too, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And this way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is true in front of them. The more you have to live for, the less you have to live on. When you know what I'm giving for, what I'm sacrificing for is important. It changes everything. And then generosity strengthens my faith. Can I really trust God in the area of money? I, I can't, you can't pressure somebody. You can't guilt somebody into giving. I can make you give $5 here, $10 here, but as soon as I'm gone, or as soon as the, the motivation is over with, you're, that's something you just do out of obligation. Spirit of generosity, you're doing it because you have a passion and a love for them. And if you have a passion and love for something, you will give towards something. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, you, mu you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. You know what he's saying? Hang on. 
When you give and you have a spirit of generosity and, 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 and somebody says, you know what? I can tell that you love people because of the way that you give towards people. Or you go to the CPA. This happened just this week. You go to the CPA and they say, you give way too much money to the church. If you would cut that out, you would have this. Or you go try to buy a car and they say, well, how much can you afford? Yeah, I can afford this. And then they say, they say, do you give to the church? If you quit giving $100 a week to the church, you could have a $400 nicer car. What's more important, the car or God? Man, I got my savings account, and we're going to Las Vegas in, in July. Well, you know what? Las Vegas in July is a great trip. But don't sacrifice what God has in store for you to go to Las Vegas. Because the blessings of God on generosity cannot be measured. You say, well, how do, I, how do we know it's going to be measured? It may not be if you give $20 today that you're going to get a $20 check in the mail tomorrow. I wish that would take place. We'd all give all kinds of money if we thought every penny I give, God's going to give me that much more in return. The blessing of God is not necessarily financial in nature. The blessing of God could be protection, protection over your health. It could be allowing your car to go longer. It could be allowing the dishwasher not to break after five years and run until 10 years. It may be that, that he allows things to take place and the windfall of blessing comes upon you. It may be in all kinds of different areas because, you know, we have to think, God says, my ways are not like your ways. My ways are higher than you. You can't think like me, but I can bless you because I own everything, and it's a stewardship issue. Here's the issue. If you have closed fists with your resources, you can't get any more. It's yours. I'm holding on tight. That's my money. That's my stuff. Those are mine. And God is saying, enjoy it. Enjoy what you can have. But when we open up our hearts and open up our lives and open up our resources and say, God, I trust you. You have said that you are going to open up the windows of heaven and bless me if I have a spirit of generosity. When I see something and I know there is a need and I can meet that need and I say, yes, you just opened up the spark of generosity and allowed the window of heaven to bless you. But when you see there's a need, and you see that something's taking place, and you say, nah, somebody else will do that. Close fists. Close fists. God is saying, Willie, we're waiting. Generosity is an investment for eternity. First Timothy chapter 6 says, for your money to do good, Always be ready to share with others. Whatever God has given you, by doing this, you will be strong up, real, you, you'll be storing up real treasures for yourselves in heaven. It is not only a safe investment for eternity, and you will be living a fruitful Christian life down here as well. Store up your treasures in heaven. How do we store up treasures in heaven? Through ministry. Through children's ministry youth ministry, sports ministry, your family, you leading people to the Lord, you giving so the nursery can be remodeled, you giving so ministries can take place, camps can be ran, cell groups could be going, missions to be involving. We are not here just to save for ourselves. We're not here to enjoy church for ourselves. We are investing our resources for bigger things than us. Clearly, clearly bigger things than these four stinking walls. I, I, I have a, one of my best friends started a church down in Dallas. I started six years ago, and, and uh, uh, he's still in a school. And church runs more than us, and started it six years ago. And every, every Sunday morning at 6 o'clock, he has 50 people, unloads the trailers, sets up the chairs, sets up the sound systems, and they start at 6, and they get out of that church at 4 o'clock that afternoon, every Sunday. 
every Sunday. And he says, oh, Bruce, I would love to have a building. I said, oh, Brad, I would love not to have the payment. <laughs> Sometimes what we have, we need to use. But what we have, we need to be good stewards of. And I need to ask the church to lay up for yourselves. Think about what God can do in your generosity. Because generosity blesses me or you in return. Generous people will be blessed. In Deuteronomy it says this, give generously to them that do without. It was not a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. You know, when we do counseling, I, I used to get upset when, when somebody would say something to me about their finances. And I would say, I said, well, do you, do you give to the church? No, I don't give to the church. I can't afford to give to the church. I, I don't have any money to give to the church. And I said, that is exactly, you're not going to understand this, but that is exactly why you're in the situation that you're in. Because you can't afford not to give to God. Because if you don't give to God, you are only hurting yourself. But if it is, if it's $10 a week or $20 or $500 a week, we have $1,000 a week gifts. It makes it, it's all proportionate. It's, sacrificial giving is not how much you give, it's how much you have left. But when somebody doesn't have anything and they give $10, $15, that opens the eyes of God and the heart of God, and that allows the blessings of God to start flowing within your life. But when you don't give, God can't bless. But when you do give, open the door of heaven and see what God can do for you. Generosity is not stingy. Generosity is saying, Lord, I can't do this without you. I can't live without you. Generosity makes me and other people happy. <laughs> you ever seen a generous spirit? When somebody gives something or does something just because they can. What it does to the person that received the gift, but what it does to the person that gave the gift. It changes everything about them. Generosity makes me happy. The Lord Jesus said himself, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. And that's the spirit of generosity. It is more happy when I have the spirit of generosity, when I see that there's a need and I can meet that need and I don't think only what's in my account, I think what I can put into God's account. Happy people are givers. Happy people see things that other people do not see. Happy people and giving people can meet a need of intuition. They see if there's a need. They give a card. They do certain things because they sense that there's a need and they have a generous spirit and they say, I want to meet a need. Our church needs to be generous. Not only the people within the church to the church, but the church outside the church needs to see a generous church. We need to be able to give monies to people that are in needing. We need to be able to give monies to missionaries that are struggling. We need to be able to be a generous church. We need to be able to do ministries like we've never done ministries before. When I told you 2008 hit, and it was a depression time within my life, and honestly, we, we struggled to make sure the bills are paid and what bills are we going to pay and how we're going to make this thing happen. As the senior pastor of the church, in my leadership role, it took a major hit. Last week, this was about an eight-year ordeal. Last week, I went to a conference, and the conference was on leadership. And they said in that leadership conference, serve out of your strengths. But be aware of your weaknesses. Allow your church to see what you're afraid of. And I'm telling you right now, if you've been here for any length of time, what I'm saying to you right now is 
my fear. It is my weakness. My weakness is I want anyone that walks in those doors to think Glenville has got it going. I want everybody to think that we are doing great and everything's wonderful. Pastor's doing great in the preaching. Justin's rocking at the, at the music and the ministries are going good. The children's ministry's rocking. The nursery's doing good. You just come in here and enjoy what Glenville has, to, has in store. But I have found out long ago it is not a show. I have found out long ago that what we need is we need the power and the blessing of God. Because you can put on a show. Churches put on shows all day long, and they're good shows. And it doesn't do any good. What does good is when we get to the heart of people's lives, and we get the maturity going within their life, and we ask God to bless them individually. And God supernaturally gets into their lives and transforms them and loves them and grows them. And guess what? When something is needed, I'll take care of that. When somebody needs something, I'll do that. When somebody has to have something, let me go do that. Because a generous church not only thinks about finances, they think about people. They think about what we can do to serve people. Generous churches are blessed by God. It's not about how good it is up here. It's how blessed we are out there. And when we are a blessed church, we are a generous church church we're saying God I can do this because I want you to be in charge I want you to give the blessing I don't want to do it ourselves we want to do something so so audacious that God has to come on God has to take care of it but he wants us individually to be generous if you can't in your mind you can't I'm telling you, you have to. It's impossible for you to grow spiritually and financially if you do not bless others by your generosity. It's impossible for the church to go where it needs to go in ministry if the church isn't generous, if we don't give our way out of debt if we don't give to others, if the church body doesn't give in and say, let us do what God wants us to do. I believe we are doing a lot of things good. And I'm very excited about a lot of things within the church. My biggest, deepest fear is right here. Pennies to the dollar. If this church would understand you're not giving to Glenville. You're clearly not giving to Bruce. You're giving to the work of Almighty God. And when we give to the work of Almighty God, He is going to be lifted up. He is going to be glorified. Children are going to get saved. Lives are going to transform. Marriages will be restored. People's lives will be totally different when we have a generous spirit. But when we have to take every area of our monies just to keep these four walls up. That's not what God has in store for us. That's what we are doing ourselves. We need the power of God in our lives. Justin, if you'd make your way up, we're going to have a, a, a weird invitation. A symbolic invitation. Um, you know, we do the Lord's Supper every once in a while, and um, we ask everybody to come forward. It's a learning, training time of saying, it's only money. You've lived with it, and you lived without it, right? You've had a mobile home, and you've had a five-bedroom house before. You've had two cars, you've had no cars. It's all what you have is what you're going to spend. What this is, is, you know what? It's only money. Let's start being generous. Let's learn to train our children that everything that we have is God's. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your love. And Lord, I pray that you will change our hearts by allowing everything that we have to be yours. And these little pockets of change 
to be symbolic of everything I have is yours anyway. And let me train others to love others by giving to others. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.